Hi. Just let the hogs take a nice close up of my dress here. <laughs> Hi there. My name is Maya Lan, and I'm an interpreter with the National Gallery of Canada. We're here today at the gallery to give you a close up look at our European collection. Today, specifically, we're looking at flowers and art, and it isn't a coincidence because as uh, we're in the middle of May, tulips have been blooming, and so have daffodils been blooming in Majors Hill Park as well as the Dow's Lake Pavilion. So we're going to be walking through the European collection, specifically looking at flowers and art. Some flowers have huge symbolism, significance, and some are a bit more decorative, sort of like my dress here. Um, so we've been doing these Instagram live tours for the past few weeks uh, in order to get you guys a little bit closer to the collection from the comfort of your home. If you have any questions for us during the visit, please leave them in the comments. If you like what you see today, also leave those in the comments and we'll be uploading this video later on to our Instagram TV page. So I think I'm ready to start the tour, unless you have any questions before we start? Well, I was wondering about your name. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> so uh, just before I continue about my name, um, who's speaking, who I'm speaking to is Laurence. Laurence is my colleague, and she will be joining us today. That's her thumb. So she'll be looking over, she'll be monitoring the questions and comments and relaying those back to me. If we don't get to them in time, we'll, get, we'll have a moment for questions at the end of the visit. So I think we can all agree that Everyone can appreciate the simple beauty of flowers. Uh, we eat them, we have them on our clothing, we have them in our gardens. Um, my mother is one of those people who really loves flowers. And my name, my Lan, is actually two names of Vietnamese flowers that blossom in the south of Vietnam. So my is this little yellow uh, flower that grows before an apricot and Lan signifies orchid. So just kind of like my name, flowers are admired for their beauty, you know. <laughs> no, I'm just okay. kidding. <laughs> no, I think they're admired for their beauty, but they can also have a great significance too. Like orchids have the significance of strength. And I think that was in what my mother had intended for my name. I don't think she was trying to beautify me too much. Anyways, the tour is not about my name or me. The tour is about flowers and art at the National Gallery's collection, specifically in the European collection. So we're going to start our tour off with a work just behind me. This is a work by Jan Bruegel, the Elder. So I'll let Laurence get a little bit closer. Um, you know everyone likes close-ups. And as she gets closer, you're going to see the different types of flowers. So there are some rare tulips, like this one that she's uh, just zooming away from. Um, this is an iris over here. So some specimens are quite rare and some are common. What's interesting about this still life is that a lot of these flowers wouldn't have necessarily grown in the same region or bloomed at the same time. So this is very much like an idealized bouquet of flowers. The title of this work is Still Life with Flowers in a Stoneware Vase. So the type of vase is stone and it was created circa 1610. What I personally love about this painting is that it has a very dark background so those colors the flowers really pop there's a nice strong contrast between the two you also notice that there might be some bugs hidden if you guys can see any bugs on your end please let us know what you see and if you can identify some flowers leave those in the comments as well So interestingly enough about Jan Bruegel, he, had his, he was very technically skilled and he, he also had the nickname Velvet Bruegel for his delicate touch when approaching paintings. He also studied the flowers individually and then kind of had a bank of images and would work from that bank of images and create different compositions. So other still lives exist of similar flowers but maybe perhaps a different arrangement. What's also interesting about this particular portrait is that for us, the viewer, it's very frontal, so we can admire all the flowers, but if this were to be a real vase of flowers, it wouldn't necessarily stand up naturally like that. So like I said, it's a very much idealized uh, still life of, of flowers. Are there any questions or comments so far? Yeah, a lot. So oh, really? <laughs> a lot of the flowers and name of flowers, tulip, iris, mm -hmm. um, someone says dramatic yet whimsical yeah i would agree there is something quite dramatic about the dark background and then these bright colors um and whimsical for sure especially with like these lines that are created through these smaller flowers here these are but more wild flowers 
Someone else asked about, is it oil on Canva? That's a great question. It's a, it is oil paint, but it's not on canvas. It's on oak. Oh. So, unfortunately, we can't get too close without breaking some rules here. But from my point of view, I can actually see that it doesn't have this canvas texture on it. It has a bit more of a hard texture. What I've noticed is that there's even insects that you don't see at first, like this mm -hmm. little guy that I'm pointing on. This is a dragonfly of some sort. Yeah, but from far away, I didn't, I didn't, maybe I'm blind, but I didn't see it. <laughs> uh, so someone says it looks a bit shiny. Is that because of the, of the oak? Um, that could be the oak, but it could also be the, the pigments in the paints. What do you think? Yeah, I'm not quite sure. Um, Would this have had a varnish at the time? I'm not sure. What again, it, it, what's interesting again though on another subject is I just realized now that you have darker leaves mm -hmm. and darker flowers all around, basically in the background. I didn't mm -hmm. notice that the first time we did this. Um, so that's really interesting. Yeah, it's almost like these uh, flowers that are kind of like in shadows. So it kind of looks like a textured black. Yeah. I'm not entirely sure where the shine comes from, but I will look into that. Thank you for that question. Great so I'll let Laurence um, get closer to the panel text so you folks can see the information if you might have missed the introduction. And the next work we're going to look at is actually, that's the French one. Oh, <laughs> I'm still on um, the French one here. Uh, well, the next work that we're going to look at is actually Jan Bruegel II, the, the, the younger. So it's a work made by his son. Right. Kind of daunting to be in the same gallery as your father. So the shine in this in this painting, it, it, the painting itself is actually behind a piece of glass. So you might see a bit of a reflection and a bit of a shine. So just be aware of that. So it's another still life. This is done um, a few years later though. This was done around 1625, and like I mentioned, this is Jan Bruegel the Younger, so the son of Jan Bruegel, the one that we just saw. And if you notice any similarities or differences between the two, I encourage you to leave those in the comments. Some similarities would be the fact that they're both still lives and bouquets of arranged flowers that might not have grown in the same region. Uh, but the vase is what's definitely strikingly different to me. So I'll, I'll let Vahas look at those flowers so you can kind of see the differences in how he treats the tulips. These are very rare tulips. Um, there was a tulip mania in 1636 and 1637. So tulips were kind of just a huge boom of tulips uh, exports across the world. And it, it did create a bit of a, I don't know if I want to call it an economic crisis, but kind of in the sense that there were all these different types of tulips, but not all of them could last. So some of these tulips here are very rare. Um, yeah, the vase. So this is a faience vase, and what that means is that's a vase of uh, Italy, I believe. And so there's figures on it. So he's got even more floral decorations on it and figures on it. And this is this is something that he liked. It added another you know element to the painting, another interest. His background is much darker than that of his father's, and I feel like he's a bit more I don't know generous, but there's more on the table here, and we see much more of the shadow of the vase. So I get a bit more sense of space from my point of view, but if you folks see different similarities, uh, uh, differences between the two or similarities, just let us know what you see. So I do have a couple of comments here. Mm -hmm. So um, beautiful details, um, indeed. Um, someone saw a grasshopper, not sure. Sure, I saw the grasshopper. Maybe I seen it somewhere. Um, someone asked if that this is a loan. This actually was purchased in 1963. I believe it was on loan for some time, and then we eventually purchased it. I think also this one might have been associated. We thought it was it was it was the elder, and then we later found out it was actually a painting by the younger. So last time we did, we did this live, I mean, an hour ago in <laughs> French, um, some people were saying that uh, this one was um, 
not as happy as the first one. I don't know if anyone agree with that statement that was made. I think I'm starting to understand what it might have meant by that. This one doesn't seem as happy because of maybe the shape of the petals. I feel like they're a lot more downwards, especially in this tulip here. They're kind of, the, the petals are kind of going outwards. And if we look at the lilies up here, oops, pardon my hand. If you look at the irises up here, or lilies, they kind of are opening more. Whereas in Jan Bruegel, the elders, they were a bit, uh, they almost looked fresher, more fresh, the flowers. So someone here says uh, they are both breathtaking. And it's true. And again, I was asking in the French store about those flowers um, that are painted with that really, really dark blue. Uh, and I was asking Mylan if she thought that this was intentional. Uh, intentional, yeah, to use that color since we can't really see it too much and she answered i i think it might have been to add something a bit more dynamic to the background perhaps to encourage the viewer to look a little bit longer and notice those details you might not see right away i have a couple of questions sure uh so someone is asking if this is on canva this is another one that's actually on oak so both of these uh both of the bruegel paintings even though they're father and son both of them are oil on oak Okay, and someone asked, why did he paint the same still life uh, uh, than his father, than his father? Oh, well, these are technically two different still lives, but are they asking maybe why they continue to paint in that style? Well, to answer that question, um, they're slightly different just because of the use of flowers, but I think there's a lot of, uh, they're from, part of a legacy of family of people who really love the natural world. So Jan Bruegel II definitely learned from his father, and Jan Bruegel the Elder actually learned from his father, who was another painter in landscape painting. So I think it's just a really strong interest within the Bruegel family to represent the natural world in a very realistic, highly detailed way. But these are also Flemish artists, and they were producing these works in Antwerp. And Antwerp was really, um, that kind of scene at that time was really focused on representing the natural world in this really botanical accurate manner. If there's no other questions or comments, we'll move on to the next one. This is the Itzket here. Okay. Okay, and we'll move on to just over here, right next to the painting. This is a cabinet. And this cabinet would have been made circa 1610 or 16, yes, 1610, 1615. And this cabinet uh, would have been made by in Italy in Florence. So what I love about this cabinet is the way it's been decorated with florals. It's unlike the still lifes that were really focused on accuracy and precision, realism. These are more stylized flowers here. So you can definitely see that the wood that they use, the ebony that they use, how they carved into it, and they arrange the flowers and the fruit and the birds in a way that would complement the shapes that they have carved into the cabinet. We don't currently have the keys on us right now, but last tour we found out that the keys are in someone, someone has the key who works at the gallery. If we were to open this cabinet, we would actually find 18 drawers. Um, and this is called a studiolo. So studiolo is a little study. So this is something that would have kept small objects, precious objects, something perhaps like money, jewelry, maybe important documents, who knows. So every flower that you're seeing, this is inlay. So these are precious stones that have been laid into the wood. And there's also ivory in there as well. I also mentioned there's fruit. So there's some fruit at the edges here, fruit here as well. So this, I'm not sure who owned this on a personal note, but it would have probably been someone who is of wealth just because of the way that this is made and the materials that were used to make it. And it really is telling of the time it was produced. You know, these days we don't really see furniture created like this as much or in mass production 
we were kind of joking about it in the last tour about IKEA furniture versus this handcrafted cabinet. But I think it says a lot about if I can put my two cents, mm -hmm. and that's what it's worth as well, probably two cents. But mm -hmm. um, it, it, it tells us about how we uh, consume things as well, and how uh, before you were investing mm -hmm. in uh, something like that, like a, a piece of furniture. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, right now what we do is that we just buy something that it's a bit more accessible mm -hmm. uh, and that lasts sustainable. Yeah, and, and lasts less longer because, mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's a different world we're living um, Are there any questions about the cabinet? or? There's comments? a lot of comments. Okay, um, I'll take a couple before, and then we'll move on to the next. Yes, well, um, a lot of people see amazing, uh, say amazing that uh, it's something that they never seen before. Um, there is, uh, Quail Monique says, there is no point on this question form. Oh, no point to, what, what do they mean? No point to the flowers? Maybe mentioning symbolism? Um, here we're not so much focused on symbolism here. I feel it as though that these could have been maybe regional flowers to decorate this cabinet. Um, I haven't read too much sim heavy symbolism in the use of these flowers. She actually, I think she actually made paint. <laughs> oh, uh, it, not no point, but no paint. Oh no, no, there's no <laughs> paint in here. Yeah, so it, what it, what you're seeing is actually precious stones that have been inlaid into the wood itself, and there is metal and structure as well. But no, it's uh, no paint. Wow, impressive. That makes the work <laughs> so much more impressive. Um, no point to this. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I was questioning it. Uh, someone says there's a big tradition of inlay stone work in Italy. Yes, in Florence. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and um, yeah, uh, someone asked a little bit to Lexi. Ask how were creators trained? How were creators trained? Um, I would have, I would imagine through a workshop, you know, um, similar to painters, you have an interest and you kind of go into a workshop. For this type of work, I'm not entirely sure. Um, if someone on the other end does know how an artist who works in cabinetry, especially this era in Florence, if you know the answer to how someone would have been trained formally, please leave it in the comments. Um, that's a great question. All right. Well, I think it's time to continue on to our next tour. We'll just go to the label text here. So this will give you a bit more information if you missed the introduction, uh, the cabinet here, and these are all the list of the different materials. These would have been pretty, um, pretty pricey materials for the time. And then if the house goes a little bit higher, this is what the cabinet looks like when it's opened. So there's even more flower, floral decorations inside. There's even a, a paysage, a landscape there. And I, um, that's 18 drawers. Okay, we'll continue the tour. Yeah, let's go. A larger painting, much larger painting by Yasin Kligo. This was done in 1699, and the title of this uh, work is Jean de Juge and his family. So on the far left side, this is Jean de Juge, his wife Emily, uh, not Emily, excuse me, Elizabeth, and their daughter Marguerite Charlotte. So what we're looking at here for florals, in terms of florals, if you look florals on her. I'm sorry if, if we lost each other. We had a poor connection, so the the, the filming was paused. Oh, okay. So we're back in. Okay, so <laughs> we'll notice some floral decoration on Elizabeth's uh, dress here, stylized. And there's also some nice shine in there. So you can kind of get an idea of the, the wealth of this family. And as Laurence moves uh, to the right, you'll also notice after this cute puppy. <laughs> Is he cute though? He's really cute. Um, you'll notice a basket of flowers here. So this isn't like the bouquet of flowers that we saw that were really perfectly picked and arranged and composed by the painters, but this kind of just like a mix, a blend of different flowers, perhaps from their garden. 
So the purpose for the flowers being here would be to demonstrate the technical skill of the painter. So yes, and he go to show, you know, how good he is at uh, painting real life and the natural life. But it can also serve as uh, an indicator of the social status of this family as well. Uh, what also adds to the social status of the family is, I mean, the fact that they have this bird, dog, um, this beautiful cushion, and these very kind of exaggerated clothing and, and folded fabrics on top of them, great hair. So we can kind of get an idea that this is, uh, you know, it's a wealthy family for sure. Let's, let's go to the gossip about the, the family. Let's go a bit of the gossip, the juicy gossip. So a little fun fact about this, Yacine Rigaud was a close family friend to Jean Le Juge. Uh, unfortunately, Jean Le Juge did pass away. Uh, after his death, uh, Hyacinth uh, Rigaud, the artist, he then married uh, Jean Le Juge's widow, Elizabeth Here. And he enjoyed making this portrait so much that years later after this was made, he made another painting of him painting this painting. Does that make sense? So there's another painting that exists out there that is of Yacine Rigaud. It's a self-portrait of him producing this work of art, this portrait here. I love that. There's always a good story behind every painting. Oh, yeah. Okay. If there are any questions or comments about this uh, one, let me know. Yes. Yeah, so beautiful rendering of texture, of flowers, fabric textile, great hair. Do you agree on the hair? Okay, uh, let me see. Artist Ken Gilders. Ex uh, question. Okay, uh, let's get a full shot of this. And could you repeat that question? Is it a gilder? Uh, the frame has been gilded. So the frame is carved wood and then gilded. But the painting itself, I don't know that the painting itself is gilded. It's oil on canvas. But are they asking about the frame? I think maybe it was for the other painting. I'm, I'm not sure, because we do have a couple of seconds uh, la well, not oh, live, like a, a bit of a delay, of a delay. so okay. it might be the other painting, um, maybe just, uh, the frame. yeah, maybe yeah. just um, uh, ask a question again on the other painting or just specify if it's that painting or the other painting and sure. we can maybe um, uh, answer it. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions about this one here? If you guys have any questions um, and we don't get to them right away, feel free to ask them at the end of the tour. Also, this video will be uploaded to our Instagram TV page either later tonight or tomorrow, so you can ask more questions there and some will be sure to answer. Um, so I'll get you, uh, let you take a full frame shot and then a shot of the label and we'll move on to our next one. So we have the question again. What question? Uh, the question. So describe artist versus gilder for this artist. Describe an artist versus a gilder. As so I guess so, well, an artist would be uh, in charge of well, in charge of making the painting, producing the painting, and then a gilder would be someone who gilds on top of the frame. That technical job of applying gold leaf or gilding a frame. That's how I would define it. Yeah. I mean, a gilder is, I would also consider a gilder an artist as well. But I guess if they have the job title gilder, that's just more specific about what they do in it every day to day. Hopefully that answers the question. <laughs> Thumbs up. Everyone's an artist. <laughs> well, we can talk about that later. Um, this is our next stop here. This is a work by Antonio Canova. It's called Dancer. And there are different versions of Dancer that exist around the world. Our version here, she has her hands on her hips, she's grabbing her dress, and um, by grabbing her dress, we really see the curvatures of her body, which is beautiful and stunning. And she's not in this dancing pose that maybe we recognize in contemporary dance today, but it's more of a, a lighter dance. 
So some of you might be wondering where are the flowers in this work of art and if we look closely at her head you'll notice a garland of flowers. So they're not necessarily specified flowers, what type of flowers they are, but a uh, garland of flowers on women's heads, especially young women's heads, are often associated with beauty, innocence, and purity. What I love about this sculpture is that it definitely pays homage to antiquity, kind of classical art, uh, Greek and Roman art, and myths. Uh, and this was made uh, circa 1812, so definitely a neoclassical artist. When we see, so garlands and crowns are a bit different. We see crowns like laurel wreaths or olive crowns. Those are often associated with victory and honor. Um, you will often see them at festivities and celebrations as well. But usually with women, uh, in this type of mythology, you'll see garlands of flowers. So talking about symbolism, just for a quick moment here, symbolism and flowers can vary depending on the artist on the type of flower and also cultural, cultural traditions as well. So in some instances, an iris might have a different significance than say another traditional group or cultural group. And I don't know if Laurence can get a shot of this, but behind the dancer, there is a tree trunk. And I'll stand here so you don't get any of the artworks in the back. So this is a tree trunk here to support the marble sculpture. But I think it's important to mention just because looking at the, at the, at the trunk and the way it's been cut and, and designed, you can really see the skill that Antonia Canova had. Uh, very good hands at representing the natural world through marble. You know, especially when I look at her, her arms and her dress, the folds, all these details, it almost seems like someone who's there in real life. Someone is asking, uh, where is this sculpture from? Where is this sculpture from? Yeah. So he's an Italian artist. Um, if, if they're asking about that, he's an Italian artist. Funnily enough, Antonio Canova was the sculptor for Napoleon's family. So he made a lot of artworks for the French family. But he's an Italian artist. So someone uh, commented uh, the fabric over the skin is beautiful. Yeah. Um, I heard a story about this, um, this sculpture and, and um, that some artists would actually put the white dress mm -hmm. or put water on top of the white dress so it kind of stick to the body that way mm -hmm. um, and for, for it to be almost translucent and transparent so mm -hmm. that they could have that effect right. uh, when they the sculpture so I mean I mean there's definitely something sensual about this and I wouldn't be surprised if that was a trick that he might have used yeah for the model yeah. it might not be so fun to be in a dress that's wet <laughs> that's wet but I mean uh, but for art's sake it's striking <laughs> and I was saying in the other visit that uh, this sculpture it's put on a how do you call this my line can you help me with um, this a pedestal or a pedestal uh, thank you and uh, usually before you could actually turn it so you can actually rotate the sculpture to see it in different mm -hmm. uh, views. Uh, and um, so that was uh, something that we learned by uh, Paul Lang. Mm -hmm. Hi, Paul Lang. Yeah. Uh, a couple more things about this. I'm partial to sculpture. I love the idea that we can walk around this piece um, and view it from different angles. You can look up and down and from side to side. What I also love about this is the capture of the movement. And you really do get a sense of that with the folds of her clothing, how she's kind of, you know, getting ready to, to move ahead. Someone is asking, uh, the flowers on the garland mm -hmm. look like poppies. I, I wouldn't be surprised if they were poppies. They kind of do look like these small poppies there. Flower crowns and garlands would be made with wool and types of strings and different types of flowers as well. All right, I think we're ready to keep moving. Uh, if you folks have any questions or comments, we'll answer them when we get to the next work. So I'll let Laurence get to the label. I'm just thinking of flower crowns. Those are really popular these days for brides and also Snapchat filters. Or for... Um, <laughs> woman in Tiger King. <laughs> Carol King. Where would the sculpture have been displayed prior coming to the gallery? Do you know anything about that? 
Oh, uh, the provenance of the sculpture. Oh, I don't know it off the top of my head. No. But if we look online, um, on our website, our, you can search our collection, and on the website you can find where it was before it was here, before it was purchased. And you can do that for most works, I believe. So maybe um, Laurence or someone can type uh, the, the gallery's uh, website link. So these are a couple of my favorite still lives in the gallery. So these are two works on either side of me by Henri Fontaine Latour, who's a French painter. Both of them were produced around 1885. We have bouquet of roses over here and roses to my left. Um, you also notice there's some peonies. They look like peonies to me, especially this one here, just the way that it's kind of droopy. Peonies can be quite large and fall like that, whereas this is definitely a rose. So 1885, this is around the same time as Impressionism, but this is non-Impressionism. Uh, what I like about this is that Henri Fontaine is going back to uh, this kind of really um, high uh, precision and technical precision when we're presenting botany. So I really see a connection between him and the Bruegels. This would have been after the Victorian era. In the Victorian era, a lot of things were not necessarily allowed, and still lives could be a way of communicating certain things. So going back to symbolism of flowers, you know, roses are often associated with love and passion. But interesting enough, the color of the flower could also change the meaning. Um, some, something fun about Henri Fontaine Latour is that he heavily studied masters, uh, especially in the Louvre in Paris. So he copied a lot of paintings and studied from the masters. So I feel like that's, that, that kind of technical precision really comes through in his works of art. Similar to the Bruegels, we have a darker background, which really make the colors in the foreground of the peonies pop. And then we have these flowers on the table that are kind of like laying a bit, a little, a little droopy. Would you say that's droopy, Laurence? I would say that's droopy yeah. enough, yes. <laughs> it's a little droopy. It's a little droopy. I wanted to mention here something about Vanitas still lives. So Vanitas still life is a type of still life where we often see a skull or some sort of re reference to time and the fragility of life. I wouldn't say that this is strictly a Vanitas type of still life, but this bottom left corner here is definitely making some sort of reference to, you know, ephemeral beauty. It's gorgeous flowers, but eventually they will fall over and, I mean, dry out. Someone is commenting, um, can't smell this painting. Can I smell this painting? No, 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 I mean... Oh. <laughs> uh, uh, um, no, no, but it, the, that, the, the image itself... It's so strong yeah, that you can, can smell. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Um, so Roses have a distinct smell as well. Someone is asking, can we see any water droplet? Yes, on the petal or flowers. I don't think so. Um, one right here. Oop, I don't know if you can see it. There, that's yeah. That's a, supposed to be a water top. I don't know. Well, it seems like it. Seems like a bit of paint maybe, there. Maybe paint. <laughs> so that's a good question. I think it's up to interpretation. I think it's up to interpretation as well. I mean, there's a beautiful reflection in the glass here. That's striking. Right. And this work here, like I mentioned, is 1885, and this is oil on canvas. So for those of you who, who might have noticed the background, it does have that texture of canvas, unlike the Bruegels, which were on oak. And so I'll let Laurence take a look at the panels, and we'll bring you to
this will be the last stop of our tour today, looking at artworks. This is a work over here. Actually, both of these works on either side of me are works by Vincent van Gogh. This was produced in 1886. This is a bowl with zinnias and other flowers. So zinnias is a type of flower. And then we kind of have this blend and mixture of different types of flowers. But as you can probably notice through the camera, you can't really define any of those because of that impasto style that uh, Vincent van Gogh preferred. So impasto is a technique of thickly applying paint, really leaving some rich texture there. So we can't really tell all the types of flowers there. So this one's produced 1886. And then I'll get Laurence to point over to the other side, just so that you folks can compare the two paintings side by side. This one here was done in 1890. This is called Iris. So for those of you who are seeing similarities or differences between the two, please leave them in the comments. We'd love to see what you notice that's different or the same about the two. They're four years apart, which I find interesting because you can really tell the passing of time, kind of the evolution of the style and of the techniques. This one still has that impasto style because we're seeing still some texture coming from the thickly applied paint. But if we think of lines and color, this one's a lot more vibrant and almost chaotic to look at. All these kind of lines that are there really add a movement and an energy to it. The painting also doesn't have this high contrast from the bowl with zinnias. Bowl with zinnias was, had a, a dark backdrop similar to Henri Fontaine Atour and the Bruegels, whereas this one here, the background is a bright green and the flower also has a lot of green and the irises are blue, so there's not that strong distinction between the blue and the green. So a little bit about symbolism here. Uh, irises have, depending on their color, can have different significance. Blue irises are associated with hope. And where are these kind of symbols and, and significations for flowers come from? A lot of it comes from religious uh, stories or also from Greek myths. So there's different ways how the symbolism comes through, but here this is uh, a, symbol, a symbol for hope. So this painting was produced within, I think, when he was at saint Remy, I'm not sure if it was in the first few months of his stay there, but saint Remy was a hospital that he admitted himself to to take care of his mental health. And knowing that piece of biography and that irises are a symbol for hope, I, feel, I can't help but feel that Vincent van Gogh felt hopeful when he was creating this work of art. He was feeling perhaps maybe safe, uh, maybe comfortable to be finally in a, in a place where he's being taken care of. So a lot of comments about this one. Okay. People love it. Really? Great. Yes. So, um, and the story behind it um, is, is great as well. Let me just zoom out as this, I read the comments. I also want people to notice that these are, these are irises that haven't yet blossomed. So that also brings more hope for me. You know, something that hasn't yet, is yet to bloom, kind of new beginnings, that also reads as hopeful to me in symbolism. It's, but uh, read the comments, yeah. It's, uh, it's funny how this painting, uh, one of my favorite, disc um, so a lot of comments about the green being really great. Um, so what I like is that we, uh, as guide in, uh, mm -hmm. interpreters, we interpret uh, this a bit differently as well. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I uh, sometimes ask people is if they think this is a happy painting or a sad painting. Oh. Not that it has any... No, but just to see out of curiosity. Just to uh, see a bit how people feel. And most people will tell you that this is a happy painting. Uh, most yeah. people that I ask, from my experience, groups, uh, that's what they will say. And I always point out that the flowers that is in the foreground, uh, the, the, the the, the flower that is the most defined, if we want, mm -hmm. is kind of dying as well. It's floppy. It's floppy, yes, there you go. So um, so anyway, and that, and I just point that out, and um, that, that's interesting as well. That is interesting. Uh, to see how our feelings kind of influence the painting. And I mean, this was mentioned, I believe, in one of his letters to his brother, Theo, who was an art dealer. I believe in one of his letters, he had mentioned how Colors have this ability of representing human emotion, but equally so do flowers, because flowers are striking and have their own colors as well. 
So even though these are still lives and this is kind of nature, I almost view these as self-portraits. That's, that's my own viewing, though. Um, if you folks have different interpretations, please send them our way. I love when people have different readings of artworks. We have a lot, actually. That's I'm going to... We won't be able to read them all out loud, but thank you for your comments and questions. Uh, we will have to head to the garden. Yes. So I'll let Laurence get to the panel text there so that way you can get some more information. So a Dutch painter. So this was done in uh, 1890, so that was the last year. Um, and interestingly, this was done on cardboard. Thank you for all your comments. This work is a fan favorite, I have to say. Oh. So I'll let Laurence show you the garden. We're at the second level of the garden right now, which exists in the gallery. This is the space, these are real flowers and plants. This is a space where folks come to rest in between looking at artworks. It's quite, it's very quiet right now because the gallery's closed, but when we do reopen the news, this is another quiet area for folks to come and kind of rest and process all the art they've seen. So this was designed uh, by Cornelia Han Oberlander, as well as Moshe Safdi. Prior to 2017, the garden was a lot more geometric in the way that it placed flowers, but as you can probably notice, it's become more organic in its shape. And these are uh, ferns and types of flowers that you would find in Canada. So, different types of ferns. We have some begonias that look like they've just been planted over there. From time to time, we've had orchids. So that concludes our tour for today. I would just like to say thank you for joining us for our visit. If you have any more questions or comments, please leave them below. We'll be uploading this video onto our Instagram TV page either tonight or tomorrow. Next week, we'll be doing another visit as well, focusing on the public works in the Abadakwane Special Exhibition. And as well, it'll be always in French at 1 p.m. and English at 3 p.m. So from me, Laurence, thank you for joining us. <laughs>